A is for Alibi, the first in a series of detective novels, each named for a letter in the alphabet, and the one that started it all for Sue Grafton. What a success, published in 28 countries and 26 languages, an indelible part of the culture, and all centered on a scrappy detective named Kinsey Milhone. Tough, plain spoken, twice divorced, words that could also describe Sue herself. Now, her childhood in Kentucky was difficult. Both parents were alcoholics and later in life involved in a bitter custody battle with an ex-husband. Sue thought about the way she could, you know, make him disappear. Instead, she took the idea, you know, the dark stuff and the anger she felt and unleashed it on the page. So she did A for alibi, B for everything, C all the way down. Now she's a W. W is for wasted debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list, but with that comes the bad news. More than 30 years into Kinsey's run, Sue's only got three letters left. Oh, what a treat. Please welcome Sue Grafton! Thank you, sir. How are you? I'm well. Nice to see you. Welcome to the show. Mm, thank you. Dude, you're on W. All right. Yes, ma'am. The end is I. The end is I for sure. <laughs> I know. I hope. I know you said you wanted to do all letters of the alphabet, but in your head, did you think that was even possible? I, well, I didn't know it would work, and I don't think I should be blamed at this late date. <laughs> I mean, 31 years ago, yeah. I had this idea. It took me five years to write A is for Alibi, three years to write B, and with the publishing business, you don't know if they're going to invite you back, right. so been a good run. James, I mean, there's been much talked about, and you've talked about your parents and alcoholism and sort of the if effect it would have, but you kind of remember, certainly your father, there's a kind of a, you know, a fond memory. Well, part of that, I think, was he went off during World War II. When those guys, and they were mostly guys in those days, came back from the war, it was like one long party. Everybody is smoking, everybody's drinking, everybody's so happy to be alive. Right. And so that was not unusual. But my parents were, both sets of grandparents were Presbyterian missionaries in China. So my parents were raised with a very strict, teetotaling, careful upbringing. You know, you didn't read books on Sunday. And I think when they came to the United States to go to college, somehow the demon rum came into their lives and that was the end of that. And do you remember your, your mother's relationship differently with it than your father's? With alcohol? Yeah. Yeah, she was four feet 11. She never weighed more than 98 pounds, so she is equivalent, about the size of a fifth grader. Right. Now, take your average fifth grader and feed him a couple of jiggers of whiskey <laughs> at eight in the morning. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. So, and she, we laugh now, but this is your life, right? Yeah, you know, and, but I tell you, I, and I've said this before, it was perfect training for a writer because I had no supervision. And in our neighborhood, we had 10 kids. We just invented games. We dug holes thinking we could make a great fort in the ground. It was, I, was, I was played all day long outside when I wasn't in school. And uh, so I, I got to ride the bus from one end to the other. I got to go to the movies Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Yeah. They're just happy to have me out the house. And the other thing about being a child of an alcoholic is you learn to observe people. You need to know how drunk they are. But my parents were never violent. They were lovely, soft-spoken, well-educated, articulate readers. So, I mean, that end they did well. They just didn't do too well at parenting. But my basic feeling is you don't get to choose your parents. No. You get to choose what you do with your life. Let me read you something here. Okay. Something has to be the end sometime. But ends are also beginnings, you know. Every single story has a beginning at its end. Oh, Twig, aren't you amazing? This was my favorite book when I was a child. Well, because she had a little Twig lived in a tomato juice can, yeah. as I remember it. You're amazing. <laughs> can I keep this? You can. Well, I think we signed up in the library, but just don't tell oh, them. Oh, listen, yeah, y'all yeah, pay them the... <laughs> oh, yeah, don't tell them. <laughs> I know, I know. Don't get your fingerprints on this. Listen, when I signed it out, I signed it out Peter Mansbridge's name, who's the head of the news here, <laughs> okay. so no one even knows. Libraries are tough. <laughs> they are. That is so dear. I found interesting about your character and Kinsey, what I liked about it is almost all, certainly when I read as a kid and when I watched them on TV, almost all lead characters, anything in the detective space, P.I. space, were really young. Mm. Nancy Drew, Hardy oh, Boys, yeah. right? And, or very old. And short of Conan Doyle's Sherlock, there were very few women in their 30s. 
Yeah. And your character, you wrote a woman in her 30s. Oh, right. As this kind of lead. And I just wondered, you know... Part of that was because when I started these books, I'd been working in Hollywood, and I knew you it was... should work. Can we play something? Take a look at this, uh -oh. please. Uh-oh. You should tell her how you feel, Brent. Rhoda, I'm afraid to. I mean, for over 22 years, I've been stepped on, pushed around, taken advantage of, and I haven't said a word. It's been building up in me all these years. This one could do it. If Sandy looks at me funny, I might just blow my stack. Hi, Rhoda. That did it. Sandy, get off my back! <laughs> So that's an episode of Rhoda that you wrote. I did. I you wrote did. that episode. That's right. That was my first job in television. Uh, and so I did this episode of Rhoda called With Friends Like These. Mm -hmm. And uh, they changed every single word of it. Yeah. <laughs> but I got $1,500. That's pretty exciting. That's pretty great. That. Yeah, yeah. Do you, um, do you, do you, are, are you good in reading groups? Part of writing in television, it's a very collaborative experience. Are you good in that kind of reality? No, I'm not. I, I always say I learned two things in Hollywood. One, I am not a team player. Two, I'm not a good sport. So <laughs> what happened to me in Hollywood... You're the best. I love well, that. I know. I just started getting angrier and angrier. And I got to a point, I'd go into a network meeting, I would say anything that came to mind, and it was not always appreciated. <laughs> I was rude. And I thought, I don't want to be this kind of person. I don't want to take the money and complain about Hollywood right. and tell tales out of school. So I said to myself, nobody's got a gun to your head, sweetie. If you don't like the work, get out. So that's when I started writing AS for Alibi. Stick around. More with you right after this. <laughs> I love that. All right, coming up, she's a master at painting the perfect murder story. But just how close did one of Sue's husbands come to being a murder victim at her hand? The plot thickens next. <gasps> Sue Grafton is at the Steamtown Mall. She's doing a book signing right now. Okay, okay, Phyllis, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go down to the mall. I want you to get in line. I want you to get her to be in this commercial. This would be a huge coup, people. All right, do not take no for an answer. Okay. Does anyone actually know what Sue Grafton looks like? I mean, is she hot or? She's crazy hot. <laughs> back with Sue Grafton from the office. Hey, listen, man. She's crazy hot. That's yeah. pretty good. Right? I've never seen that clip. You've never seen I that? heard about it. I, I also appear in the movie Stranger Than Fiction. Mm -hmm. There's a scene in which Dustin Hoffman is reading one of the books. So naturally, I love that movie. Of course, We're always yeah. watching for that one special moment. <laughs> and it comes whenever it comes, right? Exactly. What do you do when the culture changes? So people today, it's a far more we're desensitized to violence. Most of the horror films are just torture porn, or at least oh, a lot are. Yeah. So when you started with A how you scared people was different or how you made people uncomfortable is different than it is today. But the human heart is not different. Crime is a little more sophisticated, takes different turns, but I'm interested in the psychology of crime. I mean, I read my paper every morning. It's like a marvel. Embezzlers, I just marvel. You know, people who think they won't get caught. And so I, there must be a little larceny in my soul, in my dark side. Is there justice as well? That, that oh, we, absolutely. Yeah. I'm very law-abiding, and, and in fact, I'm what they call a rule-governed person. So it's like if you're not supposed to cross between the lines, I don't cross between the lines. I don't turn my library books in late. No, really? no. Oh, but it's okay to steal my library books. <laughs> I know. I, I was going to pay him 35 cents. 35 cents. Chris Rock once said that you've never truly been in love unless you've once thought of killing your partner, right? At least one oh, point, yeah. you have to consider that, right? <laughs> yes. Well, I did that, as you know. You probably know the, You know everything about well, it. And I did hear that you used to fantasize about killing your second husband. Is yeah, that number accurate? two. Number yeah. two, yeah. <laughs> yeah, see, symbolic. Um, because I was getting divorced, he had put me through three custody battles. Mm -hmm. I won number one and three, lost number two. And I didn't have money. I didn't know how to fight. And what could I do but lie there thinking of ways to kill him? Mm -hmm. And came up with some beauties. I did. However, as I've stated, rule governed in Kentucky, where I was born, you're taught two things. See, everything comes down to two things. One, never call attention to yourself and never make anyone else uncomfortable. 
if you murder someone, you have already violated both of those premises. <laughs> so I thought I better, I w knew I would get caught. Who, who could have imagined that the only reason you didn't go to jail <laughs> I know. two rules in Kentucky? <laughs> exactly. I'd have been sitting here in a prison dress Right. Eating French fries, you know, which is all they serve in prison. But up here, our French fries would have cheese curds and gravy. I've and heard about it, right? that. I have heard about that. So that talk about a murder method. <laughs> <laughs> Prolonged death, Mrs. Yeah. Putin. <laughs> Do you, do you, I mean, listen, I know that in this stuff you didn't have to write, it's called Kinsey Me, but you didn't have to write the character, right? And, and you have short stories that you've written, and there's some stuff that, uh, from what I understand, a lot of this was, had to do with your mother. Yes. And the death of your mother. And you, 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 you go into great detail about what it's like to deal with mothers in here. Was it all true to you? Oh, yeah. yeah. It was not just true to me. That the, the Kit Blue stories were just straight from life. Because when she died, I had so much unfinished business. She died on my 20th birthday. Yeah. Now, symbolically, think about that. I mean, I always think about that. My birthday is her death day. Right. And so I, I came to grips with it by writing. Were you writing. close? Oh, no. No, no. <laughs> you don't get close to alcoholics, you know. Mm. But I loved her, and I pitied her, and I hated her. Yeah, I despised her. I, you know, she made my life a living hell by doing nothing by drinking too much and smoking too much and being incompetent. And you have to forgive at some point, right? Yes, I do. Well, because here I am. How can I complain? You know, right. my parents did what they did. And I don't think you can carry around that kind of baggage. It's years old. It's gone. And my job is to take care of my life and do what I need to do. What a pleasure to see you, Sue. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. W is for Wasted. We'll be right back.